Deuteronomy chapter number eight. Let's stand out of the reading of God's word. One of the things of communicating the gospel is a lot of times we feel trapped to teach on particular themes as this is Palm Sunday. So most would feel that, you know, you have to teach on um, Jesus' triumphal entry. I want to kind of stay on where we are because I believe Deuteronomy is a parallel text of the future. I believe Deuteronomy is a book. It is the second giving of the law. It is God giving a second time to people something they couldn't get the first time. God gave us Adam. Adam didn't get it right the first time, so God gave us another in Jesus. They could not comprehend what God was giving them, Eli, so they ended up being stuck in the wilderness. When they were in the wilderness, they had a leader named Moses that represented what Deuteronomy represents, which is the law. And the law couldn't take them into the promised land, which symbolized no matter how much good you do, you're not good enough to get into the promised land. So Moses ends up dying and then God ends up bringing someone else to lead them named Joshua. And his Joshua in his Greek name means Jesus saves. So I believe this Old Testament parallels a lot of what God is trying to do in the New Testament. And in the passion story of when Christ is walking into the temple on the donkey, it's a story about one that he could have rode on a horse, but he rode on a donkey, which is a highlight and an emphasis on humility which is what Deuteronomy is trying to get us to understand that in order for us to stay in the promised land, there needs to be a level of humility. So let's read Deuteronomy chapter number eight. It says this again, we read it last week. It says, be careful to obey all the commands I am giving you today. Then you will live and multiply and you will enter and occupy the land the Lord swore to give to your ancestors. Remember in Deuteronomy 7 last week, God said, I picked you because you were small, had nothing to do with you. So when you feel like you're better than anybody, remember that God picked us out of nothing good that we did, just out of pure goodness and mercy of God. And he says this, remember how the Lord God led you through the wilderness for these 40 years, humbling you and testing you to prove your character and to find out whether or not you would obey his commands. Yes, he humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna, a food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did it to teach you that people do not live Look at that New Testament, by bread alone. Because Jesus is still concealed in the Old Testament. He's revealed in the New Testament. So he did it to teach you that people do not live by bread alone, rather that we live by every word that comes out of the mouth of the Lord. For all these 40 years, your clothes did not wear out. And your feet didn't blister or swell. think about it just as a parent disciplines a child the, this is a good church where you can read the Bible and people get the word from that the Lord your God disciplines you and I for our own good so obey the commands of the Lord for God by walking in his ways and fearing him for the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. A good land. Not just any type. Good land. You may be seated in the presence of God. 
Father, breathe life to this past that you're here as we be blessed by the reading and the teaching of thine holy word. Family, this series entitled Receipts is a pop cultural term to state individuals who have a proof evidence about someone. Again, when someone says, I have receipts to my seasoned saints, y'all go use that to your grandkids and say, I got receipts. They'd be like, oh, grandma, you cool. My pastor taught me that. Um, it means that you have proof or evidence about one. Today is Palm Sunday where Jesus makes his triumphal entry a week before Resurrection Sunday, or some would say Easter. This week is labeled the Passion Week. Jesus, King of Kings, rides in on Palm Sunday on a donkey. I know Deuteronomy is before Palm Sunday, but I, of course, told you I see a parallel that can't be ignored. The passage of Deuteronomy, as we discussed last week, if you did not see last week's message, binge watch it. God makes a covenant with a people because of somebody else's sacrifice. He also demonstrates in Deuteronomy chapter number seven, he picked us way before we picked him. Yeah, that's so good. He picked us because we were small. He picked Israel because they were small. I subtitled this sermon this morning from the message series Receipts, the H3 of the wilderness. You might wanna write these down in your notes section. And if you got a pen and paper, it'll be helpful um, because I think there are important things that God may be speaking to us individually in this particular text. These three, I, this is the very important part that I want you to hear. These three things, I haven't found many people able to balance them all at the same time. At the same time. I've never seen people, Pastor Outing, hold these well in tension. Mama Ritz, I, I haven't seen people be able to master these three all at the same time. But in this particular text of Deuteronomy, which is the second giving of the law, God gives them three things I find within this text that he wants them to master and manage. And he says, if you do, you'll enter the good of the land. And you might be sitting there wondering, what are those three things? I'm glad you asked. The H3 that I want to talk about that is within this text is number one, being holy, being hungry, and being humble. I've seen people master them in sequence, but I haven't seen many people master all three of them in tandem. And God is beginning to speak about this text because these things are required by God so that the wilderness can get us off of our personal high horse and on a donkey. See, this particular text is funny because they were talking about God showing them the way and Christians were not called Christians until the New Testament. The term Christians was supposed to be a term that was making fun of Christians. Christians were originally called people of the way. Come on, church. It, it was, it, Christians was, if you wanted to find the way, you need to go work with the people of the way. I kind of like that name a little better because people of the way is directional. And I know a lot of times when we say Christian, we get different variations of what that looks like. But in their day, they were saying, if you want to know the way, you got to go follow the people of the way. And they called them the people of the way because the founder of our faith said, I am the way the truth and the life. I'm not just another way, I am the way. There, there are not a multiplicity of ways, there is just one way. And I know we live in a world that wants to have a different type of philosophy. I wanna have the energy, I wanna have the universe, I, I feel the energy. Now, nah, baby, I don't wanna worship anything that was created by somebody. I wanna worship the one who says, I'm over all of it. But, but what God was trying to do with the children of Israel is very important. This is a quote I want you to write because he wanted them to know that no problem can be solved by the same level of consciousness that created it. Albert Einstein says, no problem can be solved 
by the same level of consciousness that created it. Let me say it one more time. No problem can be solved by the same level of consciousness that created it. So God is trying to reprogram the way they think because he understands that if I don't transform their mind, their mind will corrupt any good thing that I do for them. I, I don't care if you're dying being single. If you're single in your mind when you get married, your mind will ruin the good land that God brought you into. If you're a business owner and you like to look fly all the time and you don't change your mind, you'll take your profits and eat it as opposed to reinvesting it in your company because if God doesn't change your mind, a title won't. Did y'all just understand that? That God doesn't change my mind, a title won't. And a lot of us are trying to change our title when God is like, if I could just get you to change your mind, I could do so much more with your life if I can get your mind to change. Moses is leading in this text God's choice, God's preferred choice. And he says that God is trying to see what's in their heart. Now, I believe in predestination from this aspect that God, in his foreknowledge, knows what we're going to do. Okay, so you might be saying, well, if God knows what I'm going to do, why don't he stop? God knows the choices we're going to make, but he doesn't intervene in our choices, but he already knows the choices that we're going to make from his foreknowledge. So he already knows what we're going to do, but he doesn't stop us from doing what he needs to do, because if he didn't know what we were going to do, he would not be omniscient. But from his foreknowledge, he knows what we're about to do. And he's trying to redirect our way and influence our decisions so that we end up in the good land and not a land that we created that we got to call good because it ain't God. So here it is. God wanted to test what was in their heart because it is possible to admire a person but not want to follow them. There are people you admire, but you don't want to follow. Oh man, I admire what they're doing, but I'm not following them. And there's a lot of us that God is trying to make sure that I don't want you to admire me and not follow me. I love God. I love all the things that he does, but I'm not willing to follow him. No, no, God is trying to get our hearts. To, but then he says that in this text, right there in the text, he says, uh, yeah, I want y'all to remember to obey. Holiness is about our obedience to what God commanded. Holiness is not your dress. It's not a modesty cloth you put on your head. It's not taking communion in all white. Holiness is that I look at your life and it mirrors what God wants it to look like. Holiness is not, he come on my shot now. No, because there are a lot of people who speak in tongues but can't speak to God properly. Holiness is not about what denomination you're a part of. Holiness is a lifestyle that reflects God. And you might be saying, well, that person go to church and they're not holy. Holiness is something that God is getting us to become daily. It's what we call sanctification. It is the process by which God is making us holy. So I am not as much concerned about you if you went to the club. That is a sin some aspects that is a sin in some aspects we can we can argue that all day um, but anyway we won't go on that theological rabbit trail but here's the thing if you're smoking weed that is a, well now it's legal but that is a sin if, if you're if you're drinking to the point of being if you're drinking to the point of being drunk that is a sin because we, have, we oftentimes put our United States minds out to, if you're drinking, you're in sin. Well, you do know in the Bible they drunk as part of their meals. That was a customary thing. In, in John chapter number two, they ran out of wine. They said, man, if you run out of wine, your party's going to be trash. No cap. 
trash. But that, that, was, that, that was what they did. But to do it to excess. But, but you know what, and you might be saying, well, what type of church is this? He just said they can drink. I didn't say that. I said if you get drunk, that's not a good thing. But I know holiness is working that when you are getting drunk, that something on the inside of you says, I shouldn't be doing this. Because that's the sanctifying mechanism of God working on the inside of you, saying, you know what, you're better than what you're doing. You know you just cussed them out online, and you know you shouldn't be cussing folk out, especially if you're pastor your friend. But, but if the Holy Spirit starts to work inside of you and starts to say, you know what? Your language needs to change. Your disposition needs to change. It ain't got nothing to do with my pastor. It got to do with my God. I'm not going to reverence a man more than I reverence the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to be concerned about what the man of God says. I'm concerned about what God says over my life. And therefore, I may work in progress. I may Will Smith you, but then I'll Chris Rock you because I'm fighting the two tensions. Because Paul says there's a war happening on my inside. When I want to do good, evil is always present. But I want to serve God and I want to listen to Boosie at the same time. But I got to follow God because if I don't follow God, I won't see God. Without holiness, no man can see the Lord. But, but that's, that's the tension. It's I'm single and I still have affections. I have desires. No matter how much the church tries to play it down, dumb it down, I'm a sexual being. And I don't want to do it because I want to honor God. I want to keep my covenant before God. And I want to make sure that my life reflects God. Baby, I ain't scared to do it. I ain't scared. You texting me talking about, oh, you scared? I ain't scared. I just want to honor a love that I don't want to break. But, but what God does is he leads them and then he touches their appetite. Because I recognize that you eat more when you're hungry. And, and, I, and I, know, I know this text is kind of weird because you would think that everybody shouted off of the good land. And everybody thought, man, that, that's where I want to go. But sometimes in my journey, I've discovered that sometimes it's probably the best when we're in the wilderness. Because the wilderness may be wild, but it does produce wisdom. The wilderness may be wild, but it does produce wisdom. My most grateful learning lessons did not come on the mountaintop. They came in the valley where I learned, I ain't going to do that no more. I'm not going there no more. And I feel that we learn to love God more when we're oftentimes in the struggle. I believe that the arrival into the land quenches our thirst. There's this unique tension in this generation because some of us, not all of us, matriculated with parents that were not as wealthy, but they were very consistent in their faith. They loved God with all of their heart, but they were just poor. Some weren't poor, they were poor. That's a whole nother level of poor. But we grew up as a generation saying, I don't want to be them. I want to make money. 
I want to make a lot of money and I want to love God and the bag. But what I've found, the tension has been the people that I see making the bags stop loving God. They were more in love with God when they were in the wilderness than they were in the mountaintop. Because when we are in the wilderness, we're, I don't know how I'm going to make it. I'm just trusting God. I'm just believing God. You going to church? Absolutely. I ain't got nowhere else to go. I got to go to God. But then when you start getting a taste of the promised land, now all of a sudden I got to go to brunch. I ain't got time for God. I can't do all of that. That whole God thing. What you talking about? I ain't got time for all that type of stuff. All of a sudden our appetite starts to get quenched because we got a sense of arrival. We got money now. I can wear red bottoms and Gucci and I can wear Ferragamo and I can wear Louis Vuitton and I can go out and swipe my card and not be concerned and have to pray that it will go through. I don't have to worry about what my kids are going to wear. They got multiple pairs of shoes and all of a sudden that success knows us and anesthetizes us in this sense of I am a God to myself. I don't need God alone. I can make my world happen by myself if I just grind enough, if I just work hard harder enough I can accomplish all these things versus another generation that said I'm going to forsake all of these things so that I can behold the glory of God and when they died the pastor got up there and said we know they're in heaven and the church shouted and the church rejoiced because we knew they went to church Monday then they went to church Tuesday then they went to Bible study Wednesday then they went to choir meeting Thursday then on Friday they had Friday night prayer then Saturday they went to church for the fish fry then Sunday morning they went to service then Sunday evening they had to go back to church again at night now we got another generation that comes to church once in a while and then when they die we got a second guess if they made it or not because we're not sure and God is saying sometimes it's better for you to be in the wilderness and I know your soul is saved than to bring you into the promised land in the earth and I lose your soul what shall it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit their entire soul so sometimes the wilderness is actual preservation it's crazy old people want to be young Young people want to be old. Big churches want to be small because there's something in a season that seems insignificant that is significant. You know, when you get older, have you ever been on the job and all you can think about is going home to take a nap? That nap that your kids are fighting you to go to sleep about. You're like, boy, girl, if you knew how good a nap was, you would take it as quick as you can. And if you want to know how a sanctified nap feels, go to church on Sunday morning and go to dinner after and then put your head on that pillow you're going to fall asleep like you never if you had sleep problems I guarantee you follow this pattern go to church on Sunday get some food after and then go to put your head on the bed now I lay me down to sleep I pray the Lord my soul to keep and if I die before I wake Because we start understanding that this is the journey. The trap is, the old trap was let me keep them poor so they don't see God until they get to glory. But Satan doesn't change, he's still a liar. But he does change his methods. So I see another generation that's so hungry to get to the promised land. Let's give them some of the promised land here. Because we know once they get there, they'll forget the God that brought them over. You know, it's like you graduate. You get to a certain place. Oh, I don't do that in God anymore. I, 
I'm, I'm not, I don't do that anymore. I've, I've given my time to God and I don't have to do that anymore. And God's like, wait, you giving your, your what to me? You owe me everything. Every day of your life, you owe me. You don't just owe me a few hours. You owe me all your hours. All that time you spent on screen time and you talking about you ain't got no time for God. All that time you spent talking about Will and Jada. God, dog, it is three weeks over. Move on. We tired about hearing about Will and Jada. Get your own life together because you've been slapped a bunch of times by your own spouse and you ain't said nothing. So let me tell you something that I need to make sure that my life is still hungry after God. Not part-time hunger, full-time hunger. I'm talking about got a suit on, shoes on, and you still will worship God the same. Sometimes I got to check myself and say, have you gotten to a place where you feel like you're too good to do that? Where you feel like you're too bougie to lift your hands? You're too sophisticated to do that? Baby, I'm not waiting on a snicker. I'm hungry for God because if God takes his spirit from me, David said, you can take my house, you can take my car, you can take my money but whatever you do don't take your spirit from me take everything but don't take your spirit from from me so I gotta the wilderness is a witness about our belief system it speaks to what we really believe. It shows what we really value and what we really treasure. That's what the wilderness speaks to. And you've got to allow God to take you through the wilderness so he can expose how ugly our heart really is and how contempt our heart is and how worldly our heart is and how we really want to be there and how we really want things of this world I'm not saying it is the wrestling and it is the tension between the two that God is saying I want to take you in the land but I don't want the land to take you But, but here's the thing, we can't remove God. That's what God wasn't interested in fighting with them about him being removed from the promised land because you can't remove him, but you can't replace him. See, so you ain't remove God from your life, you just replace him. Because God ain't going nowhere, he's still going to be God. Whatever decision we make, he's still going to be God. But what we can do is we can replace him. And a lot of us have replaced him because we replaced our holiness and said, God understands me, no man can judge me. Tupac said that, God didn't say that. So we replace holiness with this justification where God says, no, I set the bar high so you can come up, not so you can bring it down. It's a bar we will never reach, but it's a bar that we should never descend because we can't reach it. But the wilderness speaks to our belief system because when we can't do a thing, we try to convert it into a thing we can do. So he says, I, I want to make sure that you remain holy. I want to make sure that you remain hungry because hunger is one of the greatest things that we're missing in our generation. Because the wilderness does certain things. It educates us. It trains us. It educates us. It trains us. And it disciplines us. So as a lead pastor, I'm now starting to pray for people like, Lord, bring them back to the wilderness. And I know that sounds kind of crazy. Bring, bring them, bring them, bring them what? Bring them where? Because I found most, most people that I've led worship better when they're in trouble. I found the people who make the most money serve God less a lot of times. When God is blessing them, they acknowledge it on Facebook, but they don't acknowledge it in life. 
because it's a form of godliness. It's winning the awards and going up there and cussing everybody out, talking about drugs, and then you get up there and say, I'd like to thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the religious will say, you can't judge them. No, scripture's pretty clear. I can't judge your soul to heaven and hell, but I can judge your work. It's a form of godliness that makes me think I can do the same thing. There are some times in life where I gotta say, you know what, this will make me a whole lot of money, but I'm not willing to give up my soul. I'm gonna do it my own way, and I'm gonna ask God to bless the way that I do so that people can look at my way and say, let's follow the people of the way. God would give us wisdom that when you walk into a room that God brings you in, you won't forget God brought you there. Can God trust you to sit with kings and you not try to become like them and forget who sent you in the room? No, I ain't talking about you that graduated. I'm talking about you that barely made it through. Lived on financial aid. I'm not talking about you that got a happy marriage. No, I'm talking about you that was about to go through divorce while you were in church. I'm not talking about you that are single now and making it. I'm talking about you that were single, struggling, and you were on your face before God. No, no, no. I'm talking about a Christendom that we go back to that David says, restore unto me the joy of my salvation to where that we have the same level of passion for God like when we first got saved. I remember when I was 12, 13, 14, 16 years old, we were leading this crazy group of young folks. We would go to house to house. We were all single, no kids, no, no job, no real money, nothing. But we, we had a lot of time on our hands. And what we would do at 6 a.m., we'd go from house to house and would lead prayer. Boy, you couldn't tell us nothing. We would be all about God. Now, we weren't perfect. Some were still doing their thing, but they would show up that prayer every time at 6 a.m. because they wanted to be right before God. And then you knew the ones that really had the flesh issue because they would always be at prayer. God, I want to be right. I just want to be right. I just want every week they come. God, I want to be right and we would just be like oh God he went out last night did his thing that, that was way before we had social media we had chat rooms back in the day y'all remember them chat rooms if you want to go upstairs press one downstairs press no, no, okay all right anyway but but here was the thing so so but the thing was they were so hungry to break the back of the sin shackles that even though they messed up their hunger was pursuing holiness they were not just satisfied in where they were they were saying you know what i am tired of being where i am has your hunger left is jesus the country club that we sign up for to say that we got to check Mama raised me right. Grandma raised me right. Is our hunger deep enough to where that will die even if we never see the land? Yeah, think about your grandmas, your great grandmas. They weren't as educated, they didn't have Hebrew or Greek. But they knew the word. They prayed in the wilderness. They never saw the promised land. But they prayed that another generation would see it. You're not here because of your own goodness. You're not here because of your own smarts. You're not seated in positions because of what you've done. You're seated because your ancestors sat in the wilderness and they said to themselves, Lord, if you don't do it for me, do it for my children. Let my children see what I've never seen. And the question that I gotta ask, are we the first generation that's raising a generation that has choices on whether they're going to serve God? Oh no, I'm not gonna make my baby come to church because they got to decide within themselves if they're going to serve the Lord. No, I'm going to make sure you know God and when you get old and you decide to walk away, it won't be because I didn't teach you it. It'll be because it was a choice that you made not to serve. 
but you made it into the promised land. Now you're all that in a bag of chips. Now instead of riding on a donkey, you're riding on your horse. And God has simply said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take you off your horse. I'm going to show you what it's like to really struggle. I'm going to show you what it's like because some of us handle failure better than we handle favor. And so sometimes God got to let us experience failure so that we can see favor. So when you don't do favor right, you got to experience failure. So that failure is not God being against you. Failure is God working for you because God wants you to see favor, but the only way he can get you to see favor is to send you failure. And when God sends you failure, maybe then we will start saying, Lord, what shall I render unto you so that I may see the goodness of the Lord? So he fed them with manna. And manna is not bread. It tastes like bread but they really didn't know what it was. It was unknown. It was so weird. They called it, what is this? They just ate. I don't know what is this, but it's sustaining me. I don't know what it is, but it's keeping me. I don't know what it is, but it's protecting me. Girl, I saw your page. God don't deserve, I don't know why he does it but he just keeps doing it. I, man, I, I, you don't deserve, I don't deserve it, but he just keeps sending it every morning I wake up. This manna is right there. It feeds me. I don't know what it is. I can't even give it a name because if I give it a name, I might start worshiping the name I give it. So God made sure it is unidentifiable that all I can just say is it came from the creator. I don't know what it is. I don't know how it feeds me. I don't know how it sustains me. All I know is that I look down and my shoes look new. All I know is that I put my clothes on and they look brand new too. I don't know how God stretched my money but he did I didn't have enough money to make it to the end of the month but God did now you're sitting on me because you got a little in your savings account I'm talking about when you didn't have a savings account I'm talking about when you swiped that card and you had to hope by faith that God would let it go through I'm talking about when you had to ask somebody Lord would you let me hold some money I'll bring it back to you I promise and you had to see God manifest himself because in the wilderness you learn God you don't learn God on the mountaintop you learn God in the wilderness. You don't know God's a healer until you're sick in the wilderness. You don't know God is a provider until you don't have nothing in the wilderness. Lord, raise up a generation that will stop praising you off of what they read and stop quoting what dead men said about you, but will be able to have their own experience with you. I don't care what Calvin said. I want to know God for myself. I don't care what John Bunyan said. I want to know God for myself. I don't want to care what, what Matthew you lose the sand. I want to know God for myself. Give me a testimony that I can say I was in the wilderness and I seen God give me clothes. I was in the wilderness and I seen God give me brand new shoes. I don't know why he does it, but he just keeps doing it. I've seen him do it time and time again. I've never seen the righteous forsaken. Neither their seed begging for bread. I don't know why, but he just keeps doing but he says this he says man and I'm closing he said man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God because he's trying to train them. You gotta learn to trust me as your source. Let me tell you this story. You ready? On a cold night, a billionaire met an old poor man outside. He asked him, aren't you feeling cold outside and you're not even wearing a coat? The old man replied, I don't have a coat, but I'm used to it. The billionaire replied, wait for me, I'll just go home and get you a coat. The poor man was so happy and said, he will wait for him. The billionaire got to his house and got busy there and forgot about the poor man. 
The following morning, he remembered the poor old man and went out to find him, but found him dead due to the cold. The poor old man left a letter saying, Elder Jonathan, when I had no warm clothes, I had the mental strength to fight the cold. But when you promise to help me, I cling to your promise and it killed my mental power. See what happens when you start putting your hope in other people? If you would have kept your mind on God and said, if he comes through, praise the Lord. If he doesn't come through, I'm going to trust the Lord. And when we start putting our hope on other people, we start losing our mental fortitude. You were so much tougher until you met somebody else. You were so much tougher when God was your source. You were so much tougher when you just trusted in Jesus. But now you started meeting people and you started putting your hope in them and you lost your mental to fortitude and God says put your trust back in the source and keep your mental fortitude you're dying because you're waiting on a government you're dying because you're waiting on a savior when God already sent you one Because God's going to send you into rooms and you can't compromise who God sent you to be. I was telling Rob this week that I got invited to meet from somebody else, the governor. And I, I don't really do politics. I've seen what it did to our state attorney and I definitely don't want that. But this guy said, you need to be in there. And I said, I, I really don't care to be, but he said, you need to be in there. So we met with this lady that represents the governor. And, and you could see people's mood shifting because they're in the room with great power. And uh, one of the questions that was asked, the first question that was asked when we walked in the room was tell us about yourself. And I did. And I said, you know, God just blessed us and we have a church right down the street. We were meeting on Pine Hills Road. And um, the question was asked, well, how do you feel about abortion? Because I know your culture, community of people, don't take pride in, you know, you guys don't, abortion doesn't move you. And um, I said, well, I'd like to answer that. I said, well, we have a pregnancy center on our campus that is there to stop people from having abortions. But I, I do want to, take it one step further because I am a Christian and Christians believe in the sanctity of life but I do have a question that's oftentimes not answered on both sides what happens when the life is born where do they eat where do they sleep where's the justice for the life that's being born well yes we got both so what happens in our world is they want you to fight one thing but when you're a Christian, you see things from both. You want to fight both and. We don't want babies dying and we don't want babies being born into poverty and they can never become anything. We want babies that have the opportunity to actually go to the promised land. And we also want babies to actually be born to have an opportunity to see the promised land. But we don't want babies that all their life they're being told about the promised land that they got to watch other people eat. But you got to remain and keep your posture because God will bring you into rooms to test will you be who I called you to be so let me close with this and I'm closing most of you may not know two weeks from now is my birthday y'all don't know I didn't see it on the screen this week I don't know what happened they ain't put it on my birthday oh. um Um, let me say this. So, and I got to close with this. Gene, did I put my points up? I did. Okay, cool. Bernardo or something. So, okay, you can take that down. That's real fleshly and vain. Praise God. All right, thank you. Um, so, some of you may know, I, I, I started taking vocal lessons. Yeah, I did. Ever since I announced and put online that I started taking vocal lessons, Nate has refused to talk to me. 
I don't know why he feels like I'm going to take over, take his job. I, I said I was going to start playing keys. Zeke got real mad, sent me a, a threatening text message about it. Joel decided he's going to Kissimmee because he knew I was going to start, start playing keys and stuff, you know. And uh, so the, 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 the vocal coach told me something, Nate, that I thought was so important. He said, you need to breathe from your diaphragm. He said, you're, you're, you're speaking from your vocal cords and you're not speaking from your diaphragm. And he said, I want you to do these exercises to practice learning how to speak from your diaphragm. This will also help you articulate better and it'll also help you be heard. He said, um, but I said, well, sometimes I, I, I just will forget. He said, okay, pastor, I get it. I said, well, what, what can you do to help me remember, Couture, how to do it from my diaphragm? He said, oh, pastor, I could teach you that very easily. You, when you forget and you keep going back to your old habits, the thing that you need to do is to change your posture. He said, just go lay on your back, look up to the heavens, and you will naturally breathe from your diaphragm. Y'all miss what I just said. When you stop doing what you know to do and start going back to your old habits and start doing the things that God don't want you to do, go back to your posture. Okay, let me say it one more time. When you go back and you start doing the old habits and you don't start doing it the right way and you forget the way that you're supposed to do, what you need to do is change your posture. Lay on your back, look to the heavens, and start all over again. Once you start forgetting what God has done for you and you start thinking it is yourself, just go back, lay down on your back, look to the heavens, and start all over over again because the issue is what we've learned as a habit and what we need to do is change our posture oh, y'all just missed that no you did you know you did you did you did I'm coming back because you missed it I said whenever you go back to your old habits forget your ways what you need to do is go back and change your posture lay back on your back look to the heavens and then the natural posture will begin again okay y'all just missed what I just said I said when you start picking up old habits doing things the wrong way go back to your old posture lay on your back look to the heavens okay let me break it down for you the cliff note version i'm simply saying either you do it or god does it i would rather do it myself than have god do it for me so when i stop doing the right things i'm gonna just go back and go back to my posture versus god seeing me not do the right thing and then he put me on my back So we remember these three. Keep your hunger. Keep your holiness. Keep your humility. The three H's. Posture speaks to humility. It's not what you say. It's the posture of your heart. So let's stay hungry, let's stay holy, and let's stay humble. Because there is a land that God wants to take us. But we'll spend more time in the hallway than in the entrance. Our heads bowed, eyes closed. I want to make this appeal, whether you're virtually or in the sanctuary. Pastor, I heard 
the word of God. I'm not saved. I'm not right with God. I understand how it is to be that one that's always crying out, God, I want to do it the right way. Maybe you're here and you stop crying, God, you want to do it the right way because it doesn't even matter. But you felt God touching your heart. Only God can touch your heart. We all are sinners so badly in need of grace. Sometimes you got to get saved seven times to get it right. But you got to get it. If that's you and you're saying, PD, I, I, I don't know what it is when I come to church. I just feel like God just keeps picking on me. He just, I don't know why. And, and you know, it's, it's not about feeling bad. It's about God touching your heart because he loves you. God hates sin, but loves the sinner. And as my mentors would say, he hates what sin does to people he loves. So if you're here and you're not right with God and you're saying, PD, that's me. I want to get right. Even if it's the fifth time, I want to be right. I just want you to lift your hand. I want to pray with you. I want to agree with you. Pastor D, that's me. God bless you. God bless you. Pastor D, I just want to get right. God bless you. I just want to get right. I remember growing up in church, I would get saved over and over and over again. I was a preacher boy, but I'd get saved over and over again because I wanted to get it right. And there comes a point where you don't have to do that over and over again because you finally feel like you're able to run and not need to do that. But if you're here and you're saying, Petey, I, I raise my hand. Listen, I want you to do one bold step of faith. Scripture says if you're ashamed of him, he'll be ashamed of you. I promise I'm not going to put a mic to your face or anything. I just want to pray with you publicly. Our church wants to celebrate you, even those online. And if you're online and you're like, PD, I want to give my life to God, I want you to text the word Jesus to four, the numbers on the screen. And once you do that, our team will then begin to send communication with you on the next step. But for you who made and lifted your hand, no condemnation, no shame, no judgment. But if that's you, I want you to come to this altar. It's not a stage. It's an altar. It's the place that God has designed to alter your life. Would you come? I'd love to pray with you. Come on. Get the mental fortitude. Come on, get the mental fortitude. Come on, clap it up, church. Get the mental fortitude. Come on, church, get the mental fortitude. Come on, church, get the mental fortitude. Come on, man of God, I see you coming. Come on, women of God, five seconds I'm praying for you. Come on, I got time for you. It don't matter how many times you did it, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you're doing it today. It's not about what you did yesterday, it's about what you're doing today. Today is the gift that God gives you. Come on, let's clap it up. I feel like God is stirring some of your hearts, but you're fighting, you're fighting, you're fighting what God is trying to do in your heart. Would you come, would you come, would you come? Four seconds, I wanna pray. I don't want you to feel rushed, but I do believe God has a plan, a purpose to bring you into a good land. Man, would you come come on I don't care how many times you came I just want to get it right I just I just need to get it right I want to get it right pastor I need to get it right five seconds listen you're sitting in your seat right now and you're having the wrestling match of your life you need to win that fight and get up from that seat because that's the first step for you it's the step that says, I'm not going to let this feeling hold me down. It's God wooing you, drawing you to himself. He's pulling on you. He's tugging on you. But he can't make you do it. It's part
partnership with God. God is pulling on your heart. God is asking you, would you come? Would you come? 10 seconds, I wanna pray. Come on, come on. 10 seconds, come on, come, come on. Come one, come two, come three. Come on, God is waiting on you. He's waiting on you. Being said, all hands stretch this direction. I wanna tell you first, it's a big step. It's not an easy step, but it is a big step. Now you may not, when you go back to your seat and you go back and like all the things that you used to do are still gonna be there. But it's like going to the gym. Every single day you go, God's working on the inside. And, 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 and people may not see your change right away, but they're going to see it if you stick to it. If you stick to it, they're, they're going to see it. They're going to be like, oh, you used to do that. You don't do it as much anymore. You still do it, but not as much because the Holy Spirit is working in your heart. There's something I want to encourage and admonish you to do. You can do it from your Bible app. It's to read Proverbs every day. Read it from the message version, the simplest version to read. It's going to give you wisdom to deal with the day-to-day -day problems. The Bible is the only book that when you read it, it changes you. No other book you read changes you like the Bible. Start with Proverbs. And then the next step is get into something community-based. Not just a church home, but around people who can feel your vibe. You don't have to get around someone who's just going to throw holy oil on you every Sunday. Get around somebody's like, yeah, girl, I used to do that too, but I, I don't do that no more. And this is what I did to do, not do that. You need people that are going to keep you accountable because the accountability produces stability. If you're accountable, you'll become stable. Now, I want us all to repeat this because salvation is what we confess. God takes something as simple as what we say and turns it into salvation. So it's not just something that we're just saying, it's something that we're saying from our heart. We're exchanging seats. We're saying, God, I used to be Lord over my life, now I'm changing the seat and letting you be Lord. So I want us everybody in this church, from the balcony to the floor, to repeat with me. Say, Father, Father. say with all authority, even online, say, Father, Father. I come to you, a sinner in need of grace. I acknowledge my sins. I know my sins crucified Jesus on the cross. He died just for me. He died just for me. I could not purchase it. He did it just for me. God, help me to know how much you love me and keep me. Today, I recommit my life, my soul, my body to you. I'm not perfect. Send me help through the Holy Spirit that I might live for you all the days of my life. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Listen. Those are good tears. Those are good tears. Those are good tears. I want you to do me a gracious favor. Would you follow this wonderful gentleman, Roosevelt? He's going to follow up with you for the next 90 days. I want Mama Janice to even join them. He's going to tell you about your next steps. Very important. If you have belongings or items, I want you to grab them, and I want you to walk with those items. So if you have things in a seat, I want you to grab them. We'll wait for you to do that, and I want you to follow them. Let's clap it up for these amazing people. Grab your things. Come on, let's clap it up for them. Let's give them the courage that they need. Come on. Grab your things, come on back. Grab your things, come on down. Grab your things, come on back down. Grab your things, come on forward. You're gonna come back forward. Grab your things, you're coming back forward this way. Follow this wonderful gentleman right here. Come on church, let's give them a thunderous applause. Let's give to my left, 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 to my left. To my left, to my left, to the left.